Section 2.2, Evolution of Atomic Theory. We're going to start by looking at J.J. Thompson. He was a British physicist, and he used a cathode ray tube to discover the electron and calculate its charge to mass ratio. So let's talk about what a cathode ray tube is. So you may or may not have heard of a cathode ray tube. This is what they used to use for televisions, those giant big box televisions back in the day before uh, LEDs, plasmas, and things like that got popular. Now cathode rays is, a cathode ray is essentially just a stream of charged particles. So we've got a cathode that produces charged particles. They flow towards the anode and they're directed out down the tube here. So this is our cathode ray, just a stream of charged particles. So at the time, all they really knew was they took these elements, they heated them up, and they produced a stream of charged particles. But they didn't really know what the charged particles were made of. And J.J. Thompson helped show what they were made of. So what he did with the cathode ray here is he put it inside this tube, and about halfway down the tube, he had these two charged plates. And then on the end of the tube here, there was a fluorescent scale that would light up when it was struck with the charged particles so he could track where the ray was striking. So when he turned the ray on and then turned these charged plates on, what he noticed is after the cathode ray went through these plates, the ray would bend. It was not going at that perfect parallel angle anymore. It would bend. It would bend away from the negative plate and it would bend towards the positive plate. So he found this to be very interesting. He concluded that since the cathode ray is deflect deflected towards a positively charged plate and away from a negatively charged plate, cathode rays must have a negative charge. So he decided to call the negatively charged particles emitted from a cathode ray tube electrons. Now, how exactly did he use this to discover the charge to mass ratio? Well, I would recommend taking a minute, download the PowerPoint slides, and watch this video for yourself. It goes into a little bit more of an explanation. But essentially, he was able to measure the angle of deflection versus the strength of the electric field. And so using the angle of deflection and the strength of the electric field produced by these charged plates, he was able to determine the charge to mass ratio of the electrons that made up the cathode array. Now, the value he determined was that electrons have a charge to mass ratio of negative 1.76 times 10 to the eighth coulombs per gram, coulomb being a unit of charge, and electrons are negative, thus the negative charge. Now the currently accepted value is negative 1.758820010076 times 10 to the eighth coulombs per gram. So as we can see, well over 100 years ago, working with pretty, pretty rudimentary equipment, he got very, very close to the currently accepted value. So a pretty impressive experimental work here done by Thompson. Next, next let's look at another British physicist. His, this man's name is R.A. Millikan, or Robert Millikan, and he conducted the famous oil drop experiment. So Thompson found the charge to mass ratio, but Millikan wanted to know if he could determine the exact charge of an electron, and if he could also determine the exact mass of an electron. So what Millikan did was he took oil, he put it inside this little sprayer right here, and it would spray oil in fine droplets into this um, tube right here, or this large cylinder. So once the very fine oil droplets were inside this cylinder, he would use an x-ray, and the x-ray would atomize these droplets. Essentially, it would take these droplets and break them into small pieces, and it would produce charge on the droplets. It would make the particles charge. So essentially, it would knock uh, electrons out and make those oil droplets charged. Then what he would do is he would have these charged plates. So we'd have two charged plates right here with a pinhole in the middle, and he would carefully and finely tune the charge on these plates. So these oil droplets would suspend in midair. So these droplets are charged, and they would be suspended in midair by the electric field produced by these plates. Now, using this information and the charge from the plates, he was able to determine the charge on these oil drops. So, oil drops A, B, C, D, E. He noticed that these oil drops had different charges. Negative 4.8 times 10 to the 19th coulombs. Negative 3.2, negative 6.4, negative 1.6, negative 4.8. Now, what he noticed here is, yes, these oil drops, they did not have the same charge. However, 
The charges on the oil drops, they were all multiples of the same number. And so he thus concluded that this must be the charge of an electron, negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Now, using this charge and using Thompson's charge to mass ratio, he was able to calculate the mass of an electron. So he determined the mass of an electron to be negative, or excuse me, 9.107 times 10 to the negative 31st kilograms. This was his calculated mass of an electron. Again, this experiment was performed almost 100 years ago. The currently accepted value is 9.109 times 10 to the negative 31st kilograms. So once again, a remarkably accurate calculation given the equipment that was being worked with at the time. All right, so let's move into a few early models of the atom. So one of the first early models of the atom came from Thompson, and he described what he called a plum pudding model, modeled after the British dessert plum pudding. So what he thought was that electrons were kind of suspended in this sort of like pudding gelatinous like material that was composed of positively charged model, or excuse me, matter. And this model held for a while. The next model that came along was from a physicist named Nagaoka, and they proposed a Saturn model. So here, the electrons were proposed to be in sort of a ring around the positively charged matter in the center. So this was an interesting idea, but now Ernest Rutherford came along and he um, performed a very famous experiment, Rutherford's gold foil experiment. And so Rutherford's gold foil experiment kind of blew a hole in both of these models, the plum pudding model and the Saturn model. So in the gold foil experiment, Rutherford, he had a source of alpha particles here. So he had radium, he heated the radium up, and when radium is heated, it produced a stream or a beam of alpha particles. So alpha particles are essentially just uh, large particles of radiation. Now these alpha particles were sent towards a thin piece of gold foil. And so you have to imagine at the time that the prevailing theories, either the plum pudding model or the Saturn model, they both thought that the main portion of the nucleus was composed uh, basically just like a big uh, solid piece of matter that contained positive materials in it. This is what they thought the case was. So if you have your atoms, and your atoms are solid, and they are composed of positively charged matter, when you fire alpha particles at them, you should think that most of the alpha particles should probably bounce off since the atoms are composed of solid matter. However, that is not at all what Rutherford saw. Most of the alpha particles passed straight through the foil. They went straight through. A few of the particles were slightly deflected, and a small, smaller number of particles were significantly deflected, almost bouncing straight back. So how do we explain this? Why do most of the particles go straight through? And this can, now we arrive at the Rutherford model of an atom. So if we imagine here, um, we've got our gold atom here, we've got our little positive matter in the middle, and we've got mostly empty space. So Rutherford imagined that atoms were mostly composed of empty space. This explains why most of the alpha particles go through, because the atom is mostly empty space, and so the alpha particles just travel straight on through. Now, a few of them may slightly bounce off the positive matter in the middle, and so they are partially or slightly deflected, and a smaller number still might just so happen to land and hit that positive matter in the middle in a direct impact. And so if they hit that matter in the middle with a direct impact, they will significantly deflect and bounce off at a strong angle. So this explains why most of these particles go straight through. So he concluded the positive charge in atoms is highly concentrated in the nucleus, causing some of the alpha particles to be deflected, but most of them pass through. And we now call these positively charged particles protons. A few more major experiments. Next, Frederick Soddy, he discovered isotopes. So he discovered that there are some chemicals that have the exact same reactivity, but they have different masses. Then in 1932, James Chadwick, he discovered neutrons. So these are neutral particles which have about the same mass as a proton. So his discovery of neutrons helped helps explain Soddy's discovery of isotopes. Isotopes can be explained by an element that has different numbers of neutrons. 
So just to sum this up, J.J. Thompson, he discovered that electrons have negative charge, and he discovered and determined the charged mass ratio of an electron using a cathode ray tube. R.A. Millikan, or Robert Millikan, he discovered the charge of an electron in coulombs and the mass of an electron with his oil drop experiment. <laughs> Ernest Rutherford discovered that the positive charge protons is highly concentrated in the nucleus with his gold foil experiment. And then together, Frederick Soddy and James Chadwick discovered isotopes and neutrons. Okay, that concludes section 2.2. I'll see you in the next video for section 2.3, Atomic Structure and Symbolism.